thank you very much, uh, Christian and David, for the interest, uh, for the invitation to participate in this very uh, really stimulating uh, symposium. So um, I wanted to uh, share with you um, uh, my understanding of how to uh, approach strong correlation uh, from DFT. Of course, uh, uh, so this, this is the outline. I was just summarizing the multi-references approaches. And that's obvious, uh, increasing the number of references will, will uh, reduce the problem. But um, I also want to present it the um, perspective that uh, actually um, the single reference is not necessarily the problem. Uh, and uh, in many cases, it is, um, I, I, I'll show you that a single reference, uh, just one determinant is sufficient to describe many of the strong correlated problem. I cannot say that all the problems, but I can definitely say that. Uh, and the problem is in our function nodes. So the understanding of the systematic error in the function node is the key. And then I'll show you the progress we made in terms of uh, correction of the errors. And then the last, uh, if I still have time, I'll tell you a story about the uh, multi-reference approach based on linear response theory. So, so there's uh, here's a list of four, but there's not a complete list of uh, multi-references approach uh, within uh, density uh, functional theory framework. The range of separate approaches uh, 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 developed by uh, Andre Savin uh, separate the long range part of the Coulomb and short range. And the short range is treated with DFT functional approximation. So you reduce the cusp problem the, the Coulomb cusp. But then for long range problem, uh, it is uh, treated with a CI. So it's still an open-ended CI because it is, it's, uh, you, you have to convert the CI for the long range part. The second approach is multi-configuration uh, pair DFT. And you've heard from Laura's uh, talk briefly about this method. It's basically is a method that use a uh, cusp SDF wave function. Uh, just take the wave function and plug into the energy expression that they, ha they have uh, designed. Uh, in particular, use a pair density uh, version of DFT. And there's also a multi-state DFT uh, that uh, Jali Gao developed. Uh, that is a interesting framework to construct a low energy Hamiltonian, a, a Hamiltonian that describes low energy states of, of atomic molecules but uh, the matrix element of the Hamiltonian is constructed from DFT. So, so that's a very different approach. And then there's also an ensemble approach that is uh, uh, quite different from the rest, uh, but it's still a multi-reference, it's, it's in a different way. Okay, so, so is it necessary to use multi-references uh, in, in strong correlation with DFT? My view is that not necessary. Uh, the, the strong correlation is indeed is a major challenge within DFT. It's a ground state problem. It is a ground state problem. And in many cases, a single reference wave function is sufficient to describe the total electron density. For example, uh, uh, dissociation of multiple bonds the, because the molecule remains singlet it's a deter as one single later determinant completely capture the electron density. There's no ambiguity of that difficulty, There's no difficulty at all. The problem is the um, energy, the energy expression, the function node. So, so, um, so if we have the right energy function node, then we should be able to capture the, the, the uh, accurate approximate uh, results. So, the error is in the functional approximations. Just like uh, in the uh, density matrix uh, approach, the RDM approach, the error is in the endoparentality conditions, right? So there are many errors in DFT, uh, two outstanding systematic errors that I will talk about. It leads to a major failure in DFA in the approximation and its applications in medium. So these two errors are delocalization error 
and static correlation error. Static correlation is the failure to describe strong correlation. Uh, same, same, same issue. So these two are really together. I cannot talk about static correlation error without talking about the other one because they are really, and they mingle together with DFT. And um, so the violation of this, uh, this error are viewed can be analyzed as violation of exact conditions on the fractional charge and fractional spin in, in, in terms of density and spin density. And this exact condition on fractional charge and, and spins are principal quantum mechanics on degeneracy that is expressed in terms of density and spin density. So that's what I wanted to, to show you. So this, uh, what are these conditions? The first one is the um, fractional charge condition of uh, Purdue par Levy modules. And uh, this uh, is based on a grand canonical ensemble theory at zero temperature. So this is not a pure state theory. It's a grand canonical ensemble at, at zero temperature. And uh, it states that the energy for a fractional number of electrons should be a linear line between the two integers. And so also the electron density. So this is um, a uh, very interesting result, but it's not from, it's not, it's difficult to relate to the dissociation chemical bond, for example. But um, in uh, 2000, we have presented a, a completely different proof and also more results of degeneracy. And this is boiled down to actually, it's not about ensemble. It's about this linearity of quantum mechanical equation. The Schrodinger equation is linear. And uh, somehow if you violate this, the error is significant in DFT in, in two ways, in the delocalization error and the static correlation error. So, so here, the degeneracy principle of quantum mechanics for degenerate states is that the linear combination of any two degenerate states is also a degenerate solution. That's so simple. It's almost like a one line thing in, in a textbook. But if you change the variable, if you change a variable to wave fact, from wave function to density, how are you going to guarantee this? And failure to satisfy this is the cause, the major cause of systematic error in DFT. And that's what, what I want in the both cases. So, um, let me uh, analyze this. Take the simplest example of a molecule, H2 plus, uh, one electron only, and you dissociate this molecule to infinity. Now you have one proton with no electron and one proton with uh, electron B, okay? Uh, proton B and electron. That's one degenerate state. That's the solution. Of course, you can have the other degenerate states, electron at A and proton B has no electron, that's a degenerate state. And you can also linear combine the two degenerate states to get a third degenerate state that the electron is halfway, uh, half in A and half in B. Of course, this is all probability. Uh, it's electron density is probability. So in terms of wave function, it is trivial. This result is trivial. But in terms of electron density, it's not at all because these two half electrons are separate by infinity and they are there's no interaction between them. So the energy functional, you are forced to extend the energy functional to define this object because the two half electrons are separate by infinity and the energy has to be the same and they are not interacting. That's the reality that you change the variable. So now if we uh, follow this argument, then it's very easy. The energy of half electron is half of energy one electron because these two add together equal to that one. So it's a very simple derivation. This is the, in, the, in the principle, uh, it's very simple. And uh, it is exactly this linear line, the half point in the linear line between no electron and one electron. I have uh, this middle point result in, the, uh, in terms of density. If you want to take density as a basic variable, this is what you have to accept, or at least you have to implicitly agree with this. Otherwise you violate the degeneracy requirement or the, in quantum mechanics. Okay, 
so uh, the extension to many electrons and, uh, and any fraction is possible in that paper. So in the this this the, the linear so divide your your version without are completely uh, the same as the PPLB paper, but the the derivation is completely different. So one outcome of this is that the chemical potential concept is as a derivative of um, number of the total energy with the number of electrons. And that derivative can be uh, related to ionization energy and electron affinity rigorously. And uh, in uh, 2008, we also derived the expression in a DFT calculation with approximate function norm. How can you calculate chemical potentials? And it's really simple. If that's the hormone energy or the normal energy, that depends on you adding electron or taking electron away. So, so this actually offer a very interesting reinterpretation of the Cooperman theory. Uh, the Cooperman theory for Hachi fog, you, you take Hachi fog a, as a function node in DFT. Uh, the, Hach, the interpretation of Cooperman as a theorem is that the ionization energy of is equal to the uh, minus homo and, and, and minus lumo uh, for the electron affinity if you have frozen orbital approximation. But here, what we realize is not is different is that the chemical potential of Hachi Fock theory is given by the homo or the lumo. And of course, homo lumo approximate the, the ionization electron affinity. Uh, of course, this approximation can be good or bad depends on your functional, whether your functional satisfy that condition or not, right? So the conclusion is that homo energy is the chemical potential for electron removal, lumo energy is chemical potential for electron addition, and the fundamental gap, we can calculate from the DFT gap, good or bad, is the result of your functional. But our functional actually doesn't satisfy the linear line. Has this uh, convex behavior for typical functional and even for hybrid functional, for many, many functional. So the, you will see systematic error that uh, if you will calculate the chemical potential, you will underestimate ionization energy and overestimate electron affinity. So I minus A will be too small. And that's exactly what we see. The gap is too small out of DFT uh, calculation in most cases. And uh, the, if you do Hachi fog, it's error in the other way around, and that's the uh, then that's the um, localization error. So and uh, the uh, it also have a, uh, because of convex behavior, half electron two of the half electron is always less than the integer one. So the, the, your calculation, if you have any way to spread out your electron, you will always spread out your electron and you lower the energy and incorrectly because you the functional node do not respect the degeneracy principle in quantum mechanics. Okay, so so we call this localization error and uh, this delocalization error. And delocalization error is pervasive in, in all the functional calculations. And uh, um, I'll skip that. There's a list of problem uh, including wrong dissociation limit, too low reaction barrier, uh, overestimate uh, molecular conductance, band gap too small, it's all coming from the localization error. So, uh, and uh, this, the dissociation is in this H2 plus, this molecule. This is actually the molecule led us to think of the, the fractional problems. When you dissociate this to infinity, uh, how to focus is exact because one electron, but all the functional give you too low energy because of the localization error. Fractional distribution or spread out distribution, the energy is too low. And because your functional doesn't satisfy that requirement of degeneracy at the end, of course, the degeneracy only happens at the end. And, uh, and so you see on the left hand side is the failure in chemistry. And on the right hand side, it's analyzed in terms of exact conditions. And the delocalization error is well defined in terms of the exact condition at the limit, of course. And you can also see the, the charge distribution uh, incorrectly in your calculation. I'm, I'm just skipping. This now come to the static correlation error. There similarly, it appear uh, in, in application, uh, in, in, 
and application all the time. That the that's a large class of problem that relate to degeneracy, near degeneracy. Uh, when you have many states, that uh, if this is the strong correlation problem. And the two, the analysis the the fractional speaks. So let me take H two molecule as an example. Adding two, adding one electron to the previous problem. So here we have um, a spin down electron at the dissociation limit. You have one hydrogen atom with spin down and one hydrogen atom with spin up. That's one determinant. Well, you can uh, also have the opposite switching that degenerate solution. So these two are degenerate answer. And uh, you can linear combine the degenerate answer to get this one. And that's the symmetry preserving answer. And this answer is elect one electron with half spin up and half spin down. So the condition is that now the energy of a one electron with fractional spin with half, half up and half down has to be equal. So this is the fractional spin condition. And uh, actually we can prove that this, is, this energy has to be a constant across the entire line of uh, spin polarization, not just in the middle. The middle is what I show you, okay? So, so this is the, now we can characterize this as static correlation error in the functional. The energy is too high for a fractional spin object. And that's the end of this dissociation limit. And this is the condition that has been violated for approximate functional. So what are the known functional uh, conditions now? The fractional charge from uh, the 1982 paper, fractional spins that developed in my lab. And then we have also combined these two into fractional charge and fractional spins. So these are the conditions on the exact functional and it's violation you will see uh, very, very clearly chemical behavior that is wrong, described incorrectly. And this result are actually valid for density functional, also for one body density matrix functional, and then for many uh, body theory that based on Green's functions. So why do we have all these fractional objects? Is in wave function, everything is integer. But when you change the variable, that's where the fractional object comes in. And uh, green function, electron density, or one density matrix, you, you will have to have this fractional object. So the, um, uh, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, the chemical, uh, this paper summarized our understanding. And now I want to describe how do we go around to solve this problem. So the H2 plus, again, is an inspiration uh, for us. I will describe why it's so hard. So the correction should happen at infinity. We know the, the, the mathematical error in the functional at infinity and in terms of fractional. But when you do a calculation, there's no fraction. There's only one electron for all any distance. So the error and correction are known in terms of fractional charges, but there are, uh, there's no fractional charge at any finite r. So then that's one challenge. The second one is that the correction should appear at large distance, but not at small distance because DFT give you very good description at small distance. So, and that's, true for most uh, finite molecules. So, uh, the, so the challenge is to get the fraction. Once you have the fraction, this error in fraction is quadratic. So it's not that hard to do the corrections. Okay, so after really uh, quite a few uh, efforts of try, uh, in, uh, trying to make the correction. And the final one that we believe that uh, capture all the things that we need nearly all the things that we need is this uh, localized orbital scaling correction that developed um, in 2018. And uh, we had to, to capture the fraction and the fractional spins, we have to use um, a localized uh, object called orbitalis. If normal localized orbital that are represented uh, to represent the density matrix and the correction is size consistent and uh, systematic improvement. I'll skip this. So this localized orbital, a linear combination of canonical orbital 
And initially we use a voice localization plus an energy constraint. So the localization uh, should only among orbital with similar energy. Right? And uh, later on, we have formulated this as actually a the space localization and energy localization. So the, this uh, variance in energy eigenvalue is energy localization and as an equal footing as mixture. So this has become our now our, our standard localization approach now. So look, the orbital will localize in energy and in space, but with a balance. And uh, also the orbital include unoccupied orbitals. Uh, occupy and uh, unoccupied orbital. So this is unlike any orbital that we have seen. Uh, localized, traditionally localized orbital is localization in physical space and canonical orbitals localization in energy space. Okay. And so this is a hybrid, but it's localized. Okay. Then this allow us to capture the, the difference between hydrogen at molecular ion at small distance, it is, um, and large distance. At small distance, the uh, common lumo is a uh, big, big gap, so there's no mixing. So the occupation number, the orbital are canonical orbitals. So the orbital occupation is one and zero. When you separate out, the orbital, the gap is small, so hom homo and lumo mix, then the occupation number get half. So we get the difference between zero and half at the last distance as for distance and then allow us to use the energy expression of this quadratic. When zero is zero and one is one, but when it is a half, it has a correction. And this uh, the functional is, I'm not going to go to details, it's expressed in terms of localized orbital, and we also have orbital energy corrections. So this corrected the problem of the helium cluster ionization problem, and uh, I'm, we really don't have enough time to explain this, but it's corrected from one helium atom all the way to uh, infinite number of helium atoms. And this is very, very difficult uh, for functional to achieve. Uh, so so the, the error is, the top error is the finite difference error. Uh, it's the, the chemical potential error and the bottom is the finite difference error. And then the, you can see that the last correction just based on LDA is consistent for everywhere in up the up panel or the down panels. And applying to real chemistry, the, the T297 set of ionization energy and electron affinity, you see LDA, the red line, uh, has systematic error in ionization energy and electron affinity, but it's corrected with uh, the uh, LOSC, corrected, put on the right line. And the band gap also with, with, uh, much improved. LDA and uh, uh, this is a photo of uh, a, a figure of uh, photo emission spectrum. Photo emission spectrum that calculated from uh, LOSC based on DFT or GW. You can look at GW. So LOSC photo emission without are uh, similar to GW. GW is a green function approach, much more expensive. And uh, uh, functional using just uh, regular functional will have make very large error in the prediction. So now I'm going to go to the strong correlation. So strong correlation is uh, similarly, is because the error is in spins, not in the top number of electrons. So, uh, so uh, uh, this is an example, HF molecular dissociation restricted. So we, we, the electron density is correct. The spin density is correct in this calculation. And you can see, the traditional uh, Hartree Fock or other functional have very large error. And uh, our self consistent calculation with uh, fractional spin loss is correct, has the right dissociation limit. So, so, so also the fractional charge and fractional spin condition combined is satisfied with the fractional loss by, by, by working with quadratic form and uh, with two variables. So this is the energy expression, the fractional spin for up and for down. Okay. And uh, this is N2 molecular dissociation if we include the fractional spin uh, in the um, calculation, in the self-consistent calculation. Okay. 
uh, this is another molecular dissociation of C2H6. So multiple bonds, single bonds, we can dissociate with one determinant, proper spin density. Uh, twisting of a double bond, this is also a, a two determinant problem. If you view from DRT, it's a, a calculation uh, that requires to determine to describe correctly. And uh, uh, even CCSD uh, fail in this case. And uh, uh, B lip, the traditional functional fail uh, with uh, our frictional loss, frictional spin loss, we describe this smooth uh, behavior for the for the uh, twisting in one uh, determinant. Okay, so remaining few minutes, I'll go very quickly on a different approach on uh, uh, for a multi-reference, how to introduce multi-reference in, in DFT. So um, instead of using a wave function, uh, here this approach is a uh, using a different reference. So you use a reference system that is a um, uh, different symmetry of spin or different particle numbers, and then use linear response to describe the excitation and the excitation would restore the particle number or restore the spin. And that's uh, to express your total energy. So your reference is a, um, uh, so that the reference is a different system, but that's what you, we start with. And, but the, the uh, excitation bring the reference to the physical system. Uh, the, there are two, uh, the electron density of the system, of course, is not the reference system. It is defined by the linear response uh, by, by this expression. And there are two uh, type of linear response theory that we use. We use the uh, spin flip TTTRT to do the calculation. That means that you will start with a high spin reference, or we use a particle-particle random phase approximation. This is the particle-particle channel for electron addition excitation. So you add two electrons to the system. So in the second approach, this is like, like an embedding, it's like force phase embedding. The N minus N, N system is described by DFT and the two electron, extra electron is described in a linear response many body way and the interaction will be explicit. So then how do we do energy minimization? with respect to the density, that's what you want to do. But actually uh, the mapping between the reference density and the density are unique. So we only need to minimize the energy with respect to reference density to the this, uh, independent systems. And so this uh, reference systems is a independent non-interacting electron problem. And uh, the excitation brings in multi-reference. By, by the formula without, without calculating the CI coefficient directly. So the, the excitation will have the multi-reference in that. And this means that we describe ground state and excited state the same way with uh, multi-reference from the linear response, okay? And this is a case where I uh, dissociate, we dissociate helium hydride and uh, can, a CCSD can describe a single bond dissociation and particle-particle uh, random phase approximation doing a self consistent minimization described very, very nicely. And if we don't do the self consistent it doesn't do this at all, okay. Uh, this is a very latest readout from um, my student, uh, Jia Cheng Li, that shows that they, uh, we can improve the method in a linear response by using what is called a renormalized single approach and describe now we can dissociate uh, many uh, systems accurately. And uh, this accuracy is comparable uh, to, to CCSD uh, because CCSD is correct in this case. So limited multi-reference can be introduced with linear, linear scale, uh, linear response theory. And then I see uh, Christian is waiting to, for me to stop and uh, okay. 
Uh, thank you very much. I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this really truly inspiring presentation. So are there any questions? We have still 10 minutes uh, time. So if you have questions, please just directly unmute yourself and you can also raise your hand and then we can see it. So maybe I can I can start with the first question. Because Waitai, you kind of uh, our DFT expert here at this event. Uh, so I have kind of a more general question, I mean, which goes maybe to some extent beyond your presentation. I'm just curious to hear kind of your assessment uh, of the progress in density function theory the last 10 years. Uh, and do you kind of, are you kind of optimistic that these uh, deficiencies of the state of the art that you listed on, at the beginning, that they can be overcome, let's say the next 10 years? Uh, I, yeah, I think this is a very good question. And I ask myself all the time the same question too. And uh, the, the progress, uh, we, we see definitely quite a lot of progress. And for example, this, uh, this kind of one determinant functional approach. So this is, this is a case unambiguous for me. For this type of problem, it is completely within the the realm of one determinant. Of course, you don't have to stay that, and it will be much easier on the functional. If you use multi-reference, it will be much easier on the functional. But it is a, this is a, but here, however, is that DFT functional is universal. So, so this functional that doing this can also do a lot of other things at the same time. So, so DFT, um, the, the advantage of DFT is that, uh, well, I believe there's, only one, uh, I believe in the universal nature. Then we wanted to debug functional that describe all the things that it should describe. And strong correlation for this type of problem is definitely within that. So, so um, yes, you can walk away from DFT or modify it so that you can use multi-reference and, uh, and then uh, multi-determinant uh, as a wave function. But it's hard to to be uh, a a what do I say a universal approach. That so it may be so. For example, you do a cast calculation, then you have to decide on the number of casts for this problem, and then also the, the functional definition is not clean. It's not the rigorous. So here, so here I'm staying with exactly the functional definition without uh, bringing uh, complexity. So I believe it is it is possible that uh, that uh, DFT can achieve uh, good accuracy. So I'm not we're not going to expect uh, easily the accuracy of of very very high accuracy uh, couple cluster calculation for some systems, but we we should expect a uniformly good performance without traps because right now we're seeing oh this is a trap. If you do this, you get qualitatively wrong answer. That I think trap can be avoided. That's my, my belief. And you will end up with a functional that have probably application and then and without it uh, encounter huge challenges. But the accuracy wise, uh, that's a different stuff. Precise accuracy, the precision, then it's challenging. How to improve that? I don't have any clue. How to improve the procedure. But systematic error can be corrected. Or oh, the bottom line, systematic errors, once understood, can be corrected. So thank you a lot for this comprehensive answer. So Stefan has also a question. Yeah, so thank you for this uh, very uh, instructive talk. So I have a question also concerning this uh, fractional spin correction. So, okay. um, so if energy wise, for example, I mean, uh, what you showed here, that's quite impressive how this works. And so I've been wondering, I mean, one challenge that you also listed is, for example, in transition metal complexes, uh, one thing that people look at is, for example, spin density distributions. So I was wondering whether this kind of correction not only helps energy wise, but also gives you then uh, say a good spin uh, spin density distribution in uh, in say transition metals. Very good question. Um, I we have um, 
uh, spring density, I'm working on that. And what I can tell you is that, you see this formulation is spin restricted. So it, it, it currently as it is, it, it doesn't describe the spin density correctly, even for a vertical, right? Because for vertical, the spin density is not positive everywhere. It, it, it can be, and then if, if you have a restricted description, then it's not. So we have uh, developed a version that uh, and then in the process of finishing is uh, the spin unpolarized version. Mm -hmm. uh, that allow, actually it describes this properly. So, that, so, so, and then spin density should will be better. And we can describe vertical density correctly now. But Chinese okay. metal, we have not tried. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Are there any further questions? We have beautiful, beautiful talk. I really enjoyed all the pieces there and a lot to digest, a lot of great ideas and insights. It's always, always a pleasure to hear you talk. So thank you so much for this first talk of, this, of the session. I do have a, a follow-up question on, so I guess the functional, when you approach it this way, you're sort of building in um, sort of natural symmetry breaking. Is that correct? I mean, you can capture some degree of symmetry breaking, which in often conventional DFT, symmetry breaking has to be imposed often in, in problems involving transition metals and other things. <clears throat> yeah, so, so, so just take this example, um, this natural dissociation, uh, symmetry can break at infinity and that will be still be the right answer, right? So, and as of course, at last enough distance, the symmetry broken solution is also give you the right answer in energy. Uh, so, so our, our extension to, to, the, the, to the broken answer is that we should respect the degeneracy. And that's the really, so the symmetry preserved one and the symmetry broken one will have the same degeneracy at last yeah. distance. So, right. so, so then built in uh, the, uh, broken symmetry as a solution. Yes. I see some Without the... restricting it to a, to, to a completely uh, spin restricted calculation. I see, right. So basically that falls out naturally. As soon as one has the extension to deal with essentially the multi-determinantal nature of the wave function, that's the more general problem in the delocalization error. Correct. Once you have that understood, then the symmetry breaking is a natural consequence of, of that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It comes out. Okay, great. That's very nice. That's a symmetry broken is only acceptable at infinity, you see, but <laughs> energetically it's okay for a long, long distance. Mm -hmm. And then, then so so your function don't need to capture that. That's that's mm -hmm. my point. Great. Wait, Jeff, thank you. Great. Yeah. Are there any further questions? The audience, we still have like three, four minutes. So actually, I have another one. Also, more of a fundamental nature, because why how you emphasize this universality? I mean, of course, we're all aware of it that there exists a universal function, um, mm -hmm. but I kind of feel that there's a very high price that we have to pay in practice. I mean, I'm not familiar with these concrete approximations in DFT, so just I work more on RDMFT and other aspects. Mm -hmm. um, but so, for instance, in physics, there's an important concept, like of course, quantum phase transitions. Eh? And the nature of a quantum phase sensation is, of course, strongly linked to a non analytic behavior. So I'm kind of wondering if we scientists want to write down a function which is really truly universal, such that you can use it for all clone interacting systems. Huh? You know, we always tend to write down by hand uh, like beautiful functions which are kind of analytical or which are maybe not as non analytical as the true exact function. So this is kind of an aspect that is discussed in great detail in DFT that the, the exact universal function has to be sufficiently uh, like non beautiful. That is, uh, you, are, you are pointing out, look at my conclusion on this slide. I didn't say much. Look at this line. The exact function now cannot be an explicit and defensible function of electron density or density matrix, either local or non local. Mm -hmm. This is a conclusion out of the 2008 paper that to satisfy this condition, uh, we will find a system that it's, it's not a, we'll find a strongly correlated system like in more insulator or in the dissociation limit of H2, that the functional cannot be a defensible functional expressed in terms of density or density matrix. 
So the universal functional will have that property. None of the, our regular functional uh, have that property because when we build, and that's why when, when we do this localized orbital correction, actually it does. It has that discontinuity, but not in, it, it is not, look at this expression, it's not in terms of density matrix directly anymore. This expression, this adding on. So this, this correction does not have, this, it's not a continuous functional of electron density, but it is continuous functional of density matrix. But this spin dysfunctional, which is spin, is not a continuous function of density matrix. So, okay. so it has to come from this, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think if there are no further questions, so let's thank all the speaker again for this very nice talk. Then thank we, you. Then we continue with the next speaker, so Hardy Grosser.